John Foote, welcome to the Real Clear Values podcast. Oh, hello. Uh, delighted to be here. Thank you. John, it's great to have you on the podcast. I, I bought your book a little while ago, actually, not too long after it came out. Um, this one here, Blood and Power, The Rise and Fall of Italian Fascism. And found it a really fascinating read in relation to the use of violence for political ends. And you start the book with a really interesting story. It's a, it's a family anecdote, and it's a comment, I believe, from your great grandmother who believed that fascism was wonderful. So tell us a little bit more about that. Tell us a bit about your your family's relationship with Italian fascism and how how you really got into writing the book. Um, well, um, my part of my family is Italian. Uh, I've just actually got Italian citizenship. Um, very recently through through that line. Um, and there was always this story that my dad told about. We would have these in Cornwall, we'd all go to Cornwall for the summer and then the whole family would gather and we'd have these great lunches and dinners and there'd be a lot of politics and my family is quite a political family, mostly on the left. Um, and my dad told this story and I'd never knew my great grandmother, but he told this story about before I was born. Um, there would be lots of chatting and arguing and someone accused someone else of being, you know, a fascist or something. And that was the worst thing you could do. And suddenly she piped up and said, um, and in his telling, it was fascism, how wonderful it was. And everyone went quiet and was really embarrassed. And she'd grown up partly in Italy under Italian fascism. So it was a nice way of beginning, partly to connect it to my family, but also to underline the fact that there was, you know, there was support for fascism. It wasn't something that was entirely imposed up upon the Italian people. There was support, probably not majority support, but there was a kind of, at some points, consensus around it. I came to write the book, I suppose I've worked on kind of all aspects of Italian history in the 20th century. I've worked on different aspects of politics and history, and it was a kind of it's something I taught for a long time, but I'd never written about it at length. So it was it was a period I hadn't written about. And so I and with all these anniversaries that came up in 2022, the anniversary of the March on Rome, it seemed like a good time to to write about that at last to fill that kind of gap in my um, in my output. Yeah, it's interesting because this isn't your book isn't a biography of Mussolini is it is specifically talking about the use of violence as a means of of the ascent to power of fascism which is interesting because I was recently reading in Peter Williamson's biography of Mussolini Duce and he specifically mentions how it was very intentional that Mussolini would use violence as you know for political ends to to obtain and maintain power so this wasn't something that was just it, it was just by happenstance it was it was a very intentional political strategy of Mussolini so what was what was the political state of play in Italy before fascism then because speaking of Mussolini he was he wasn't always a fascist was he he started off on the the other side of the political spectrum didn't he yes I mean if we start with Mussolini we've got someone who grew up in a, a very radical um left-wing background his fam his father was an anarchist he he was named after various rebels and anarchists um he grew up in the sort of very rebellious um part of italy in central italy and became a leading socialist um in before the first world war uh, actually was arrested and imprisoned for anti-war activity um a very charismatic personality, a, a journalist, a very good writer, a uh, speaker, um, which was important in those times because public speaking was one of the key ways of communicating. It isn't really anymore, but it was, I mean, it is a little bit now, but much less so than it was at that time. And the key moment for him is the First World War because he, the Socialist Party, largely opposes the First World War when Italy goes in in 1915. And that's an important moment because Italy's pushed into the First World War through violent nationalism. And we might come back to that. Um, and he changes his mind famously 
He's the editor of the Socialist Party daily newspaper, Avanti. He changes his mind and starts to say the war is a revolutionary activity, he starts to support the war, and he's kicked out of the party. So he's a turncoat, you know, a traitor for the Socialist Party. And that's his kind of a beginning story for him in terms of fascism. Um, Italy goes into the First World War really unprepared and not ready and with probably the majority of people against it. It's a bloody, horrible war for the Italian people. You know, hundreds of thousands of people die. It's often forgotten in Britain, for example, that Italy even fought in the First World War, but had more, 600, more people died as a percentage of the population than, than British people did. Um, but it did win the war. But it was a, a victory that was called mutilated. Um, and so it came out of the First World War very divided, um, very dramatically debating what had happened. And that's when you get the formation of fascism is in this period of 1918, 1919, the first fascist groups start to form. Yeah, that's interesting. So the formation of the fascist groups, as I understand it, was almost spontaneous. It wasn't like Mussolini was this singular figurehead, like a cult leader that all these people coalesced around. It was more like Mussolini was having this sort of faith crisis within socialism where he was trying to figure things out, figuring where, figure out where he sat with things. And as I, as I look at other biographies as well, on that specifically on Mussolini, it seems as though he had this internal wrangling between whose cause he was going to champion more whether it was on a class basis in relation to the working class or whether it was the nation and it fell as i understand it for him on the side of the nation and then he kind of saw all of these fascist gangs that had kind of risen up and you know perpetrated acts of violence and what have you and then he kind of used that is that is that a fair summary yes i mean he what you have is the growth of something which which will then become very important and still is, I think, today, which is radical nationalism, which is a very, very extreme form of nationalism with aspects of socialism in there, aspects of the language, aspects of the policies. But really, the, the nation is, is, is seen as the, the most important thing. Um, and, the, you know, we'll see that. We'll see that in German national socialism and the name itself is, is an obvious copy in some ways of of Italian fascism. Um, so there's this radical nationalism. It's very opposed to the left. The other key thing about Italy in 1919, 1920, is that it feels like there's going to be a revolution. The left is very, very powerful. There are strikes every day. There are, you know, rebellions all over Italy, which I detail in my book. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of fear that there is going to be, you know, Italy's going to fall like Russia to a socialist revolution um and 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 that fear is also part of what italian fascism which is very small in 1919 starts to think about when we talk about the violence of italian fascism i think it's important to to note this is something new in my opinion and i this is what i really thought was the the heart of my book is this invention of political violence organized political violence so it's not something that just kind of people just beating each other up randomly or, you know, people just kind of ransacking buildings. This is this is the formation of small groups called squadristi, squads, um, who are often ex-soldiers, but not always, who use violence in a political way. They, they, they organise their violence. They use it in a very targeted way to obtain political ends. And I think this is something new in 20th century politics and it will be seen again seen again in germany seen again in other countries but also is around still today i think um and that's the crucial invention of italian fascism not ideology hmm. but this practical use of violence it's incredibly effective hmm. in destroying the left but also obtaining political ends and mussolini is one of the people behind that there are many others that it's a very kind of these groups grow up locally and have local leaders. Mussolini never gets his hands dirty. He never takes part in any violence himself. He's more of the kind of, you know, 
organizing understanding the puppet master the the puppet the puppet master yeah of the whole thing but yeah. you know it takes him quite a long time to take overall control yeah yeah that's that's interesting because it sounds to me like from a i suppose from a, a philosophical point of view to put it simply it's like it's, it's sort of like a might is right sort of approach it's like we're 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 tougher we're stronger we're more powerful in you in a physical sense we can force you to do this or not do that and so we're going to do this so so what happens then when when the fascists start this organized violence is it that is it that everybody sort of parts asunder and moves out of the way for them do people fight back how is it that they do this because because you mentioned as, as well a specific to, to get a bit more granular you mentioned the use of is it the manganella the the cudgel that they use as a as a weapon I mean, they're armed, uh, and there are lots of guns around in post-war Italy, many of them from the war. Uh, you know, it's a very heavily armed society. Mm. And in fact, incredible reading, you know, when I do this research, I read a lot of newspapers from the time, and the amount of people shot, uh, murdered, injured in that period is, is extremely high, um, you know, in everyday life, but also political violence. So these groups start mm. to form around 1919, 1920. They form in local areas. Their main targets are the left, the trade unions, the political parties on the left, not their only targets, but their main targets, or people they see as traitors, people who betrayed Italy in their mind in the First World War, particularly people who'd opposed the war, um, mm. are their main targets. And they target people, they target organisations, they target buildings. And, you know, they, they're very clever in the way that they target leaders. So they will, uh, you know, a typical squadrista attack, they'll drive in. They, they have quite a lot of infrastructure, often given to them by landowners uh, or big business. They have money, they have resources. Um, they're a kind of little army. Um, quite quickly, they become like little armies. Um, mm. And they'll drive into a town, round up the mayor, round up the trade unionists, beat them up burn down their houses, burn down the trade union buildings um, and leave. Now, this is very effective because it creates fear. It creates widespread um, people to abandon the trade unions very quickly, mm -hmm. which have been very successful. And I suppose the question you could ask yourself here is where's the state in all this? Where's yeah. the police? You know, why, why is this happen? Why is this being allowed to happen? And that's absolutely a crucial question. Because, you know, this is illegal, obviously. I mean, I don't have to tell you that. It's illegal to get a gun, drive in a car. It's against every about 20 laws. So why aren't these people being arrested? And that's a crucial question. And it's this kind of the state kind of letting this happen hmm. is also a key part of the story. Um, not arresting these people, not. Or if they do arrest them, they're kind of let off. Hmm. Um, so they think. The Italian state, the liberal state, the democracy thinks it can control this, but it can't. Yeah, interesting. So, so this is this is a classic case of the the powers that be at the time entirely underestimating what they're dealing with. They 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 don't they, they underestimate it. What so why is it then that they they turn a blind eye or they just they don't enforce the law with these organized mobs? Well, I think there's various reasons. One is co straightforward collusion, that the fascists are being helped in many cases by the army, the carabinieri, the police, given arms. I mean, there's quite a lot of evidence of this. So there's kind of, they agree with what they're doing. They're, they're anti-socialist. They don't, they want order. They want, you know, the whole terrible cliche. They want the trains to run on time, which is something that we will always repeat but what that actually betrays is constant transport strikes and rail strikes, which people were dealing with at that time, which they thought, mm. you know, it was kind of idea of chaos. Straightforward collusion in some cases. Other cases are kind of more left, much more kind of vague, nuanced tolerance. So we're going to let these people do what we want, but we'll take back control when we need to, right? Um, mm. So they can do the dirty work for us. And this is the great mistake of the liberals who govern Italy for most of its history is that kind of, okay, we'll let Mussolini, we'll get, we don't really like it, it's a bit distasteful, but we'll let them do it because um, it serves our purposes. And then we'll just carry on as before. And they make a great political error because, you know, at a certain point, the fascists start turning on the liberals and, mm. 
and they don't expect that. So one of the other enemies of fascism is liberal democracy. Hmm. Um, they don't believe in liberal democracy. They don't believe in democracy. Um, and this idea that the Italian liberal state can control them is one is a great historical error, really. Yeah, interesting. Interesting that you say, well, you refer to the view that uh, fascism has of liberalism and liberal democracy, because that's very much Mussolini's take as well. He's quite disdainful of liberalism and liberal democracy as well. In fact, as, as I as I read up on on Mussolini, and I know that he he cites Nietzsche himself, but I, his views seem to be quite Nietzschean in that respect, where he he has maybe maybe even a, a bit of disdain for for the the people on mass and believing that there should be this this elite governing body that tell everybody what to do almost like you know Nietzsche's idea of of master morality where there is this kind of this kind of elite um nobility that tells everybody else what to do and then the masses just fall into line and that in Mussolini's case he, he felt as though the masses could be manipulated through the media and then they could just be they could just be useful useful idiots so to speak or, or something to that effect so that's interesting so so from a from a, an ideological from a philosophical philosophical point of view Mussolini's in obviously he's in direct opposition with his previous bedfellows the socialists he's also against the liberals as are the fascists as well so one can imagine that that Mussolini makes his his way up the ranks in the fascists he's very charismatic like you say he's a journalist he has a platform he's very strong in his public speaking skills as well so he sort of ascends the ranks there and becomes this figurehead how then do the fascists rise to power how how is it that they do take over the main show and catch the the liberal order out so 1920 1921 the squadristi are becoming a major force they're never a particularly large number of them but they're becoming stronger and stronger better organized better armed more and more like an alternative army 21 in particular around the there's an election in 21 and that election is largely subverted by a large amount of violence uh, around the election campaign uh socialist candidates being killed uh threatened people being forced into internal exile so you have to take that even though that election a few fascists are actually elected in that election they also take the violence into parliament itself um, kicking out um, an MP who they particularly hate with guns. So they're becoming stronger and stronger. Uh, no one is, the, the opposition to them, either on the left or amongst the state, is weaker. And in particularly 21, 22, they're becoming, as I said, a kind of alternative army. They're able to march on cities and occupy them as if they were an army by then, you know, not small towns anymore. In 22, they march on large parts of Italy, central Italy, as if they're an army, set up camp, burn down, you know, tens of buildings, and no one stops them. So there's a kind of dual power uh, here. There's a kind of, they've almost become a power in the country. And then they decide to take central power, and that means Rome, which is the capital. And in October 1922, they organise something called the March on Rome, which is involves all the squadristi from all over Italy taking a kind of insurrection, if you like. Um, and I see this in a way that may, very different to many historians see it. And I think this is the way this is seen has been changing for some time. It's often been seen, for example, amongst British historians like Max Smith or Bosworth as a kind of joke, as a kind of farce, as a kind of theatre. I don't see it that way. I mean, if you look at it, the violence involved was very high. So they, they rise up at the end of October, they rise up, it's a plan. They rise up in various cities, take control of local government organizations, state organizations, and then begin to march on Rome, literally march on Rome, thousands of them. Um, and when they get to Rome, they attack newspaper offices, they attack individuals. Um, and And then you have, the liberal state is faced with a choice. Does it fight back finally? Does it use the army or does it give in? And the king, who is the head of state, 
gives in. Uh, he doesn't mobilize the army against this illegal insurrection. He basically hands over power to Mussolini. So it's an extraordinary moment. It's a kind of coup mixed with a revolution, mixed with a legal legal handover of power. Um, and Mussolini becomes prime minister on the back of this illegal insurrection uh, and the killing of about 50 people at least and the threatening of a lot more um, and the invasion of Rome with black shirts. They wore black shirts. Their uniform was quite varied, but that was one of the constants. Uh, he becomes prime minister, and from that position, he can then use the violence uh, from above as part of the state. So it changes at that point in 1922. Mm, mm. So let's let's talk a little bit about the details of this march on Rome. And so is it is it Mussolini charging forward with with arms in hand and giving a battle cry to all these fascists to, to march on Rome? Or how, how does it actually happen at the time? They, I mean, they plan it. Um, Mussolini has, there are four leading fascists in charge of it. They have strategic points, which they will then take over where the fascists are particularly strong. For example, Cremona, which is a small town in, in Northern Italy, was a particularly strong place for fascism. They took over the prefect's palace there uh, there was a, a, a bit of resistance. Some fascists died. They took over and they start. They basically occupy the offices of the state. Mussolini waits in Milan to see what's going to happen. He's mm. very. He does, he's not leading it from the front. He's leading from the back. Um, he waits to see if it's successful, and he's negotiating. They're using this violence as a negotiating tool, you know, with with the state, with the king. You know, the negotiating, what are you going to give me? I can call these guys off uh, or not. It's up to you. Mm. Do you want civil war? You know, that's the kind of thing. And when mm. when uh, the king kind of accepts Mussolini as prime minister, which is pretty shocking if you think about it, um, Mussolini then gets on the train and travels to Rome. So mm. only when it's a done deal does he make it to Rome. Then he calls off the dogs. Um, yeah that the squadristi then leave right and I many of them are really pissed off because they want they want to go further at that point you know they want to mm -hmm. they want to burn down parliament or something but they that doesn't happen mm -hmm. um and i think that's quite a canny quite a canny tactical move by mussolini he's he tactically quite astute at this point he he turns it off and on when he needs it you know yeah. he doesn't unleash full on destruction he he keeps it back as a warning for, for yeah. future opposition and the opposition kind of melts away really at that point yeah he seems as well as being highly demagogic he seems incredibly pragmatic he, he seems like like you say he only gets on the the train from milan to rome when it's worth his while and all the and all the time he's just been sat in the background essentially using this lever that he's got, which is all of, you know, this this armed, organised mob, and like you say, at four different outposts that are descending on the capital. And it's, well, do you, it's civil war or we're in power sort of thing. So it's it's, 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 a, it's a bit of an impossible, you know, it's, it's an offer that they can't refuse to, to coin a phrase. And so... No, I think, yeah, it's very interesting because many people think they take refuge... Many historians take refuge in the kind of counterfactual at this point, which is like, if the army had been mobilised, the fascists would have melted away. But that's a very, that's a very reassuring, nice little story that you can tell yourself. Mm. Actually, in my opinion, by that time, the battle had already been lost. Mm. The army would not even have had, you know, the battle on the streets had been lost. The fascists had won that battle. Mm. And, you know, the army was either neutral or worse, right? Yeah. So it's it, there wasn't really a counterfactual at that point. I think the king didn't really have much choice. It, it was all it was all too late by then. Mm. Mm. Um, and and Mussolini is very pragmatic. He he doesn't let ideology sort of dominate him. Yeah. He he isn't really an ideologue. He has he's interested in power. He's interested in you know personal power for some ends. And what he says is, you know, I want to change Italy, or whether he really does or not, 
believe in that is a different matter. There's yeah. quite a lot of cynicism. And you said it before, cynicism about the Italian people. Yeah. You know, there's famous quotes about so governing Italy is not difficult, just useless. You know, it's very kind of pithy but quite yeah. revealing quotes about he, he he's a he doesn't have much of a, a very high opinion of the masses, as it were, even though he mm. continually appeals to them in a populist way. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think he thinks that he can he can control them, that he can be that puppet master and that they're so simple minded and facile in their understanding of things that that he can do that. And like you say, he has that he has got that drive to power. And that, that, that's what I find interesting about this is that he's not an ideologue per se, but he does have quite strong values himself. And when I say values, what I mean is there are things that he wants as to achieve there's things that he wants to obtain as an end state and i think he has got very strong values in that respect but i think they're for his benefit and this is where i think he is quite a nietzschean sort of character but a nietzschean sort of character in practice rather than you know he's not writing books he's not writing philosophy but i think he was in influenced by that i had this chat with um with richard bosworth when he was on the podcast and, and he was a little skeptical because i'd read the interview between Mussolini and um Oscar is it Oscar Levy Oscar Levy Oscar Levy um of the New York Times um I think it was in 1922 and in that interview Mussolini's talking about Nietzsche as his spiritual guide and I, th I think I think Bosworth and maybe some others see that as kind of like a theatrical thing and yes Mussolini might have said that but he changed his mind all the time and I'm sure he did but I do think when you actually see his actions and how he actually did things that that philosophy did find a home within him in terms of how how he saw power how he saw other people how he what he saw as an ideal as well because bear in mind if, if we're talking about his belief in there being this elite that runs the country and all the masses just following behind that is very Nietzschean you know that is something that comes from that and that's something that that he was really putting in place through italian fascism so that's interesting so so basically there's there's kind of a, a fait accompli that the authorities are putting where it's like this is pretty much done we're in power if you really want to fight as you can but it's going to be a civil war and you might lose and there's going to be an awful lot of bloodshed you can guarantee that so there they are in power Let, before we before we move on to the actual governance of, of fascist italy john Let's talk about some of the examples of, of violent acts because there's some pretty nasty stuff that the fascists are carrying out as well. We're not just it's, it's really easy to, to look at this in the abstract when we're when we're thinking back in time. But but let's make this, you know, without being too gruesome, maybe, but just let, let's put this in a bit more concrete terms in terms of what the fascists were doing, because it was particularly unpleasant stuff, wasn't it? Yes. And I, I, that's one of the key things about my book is I want to make this violence real. Um, so I take certain individuals and tell their stories um, and, and, you know, try and make it because, you know, there's a lot of work on violence, but it often uses statistics or numbers. And it talks about, you know, 20 people were killed, but it's sort of meaningless unless you make it human and understand the consequences. So, you know, this violence was terrifying. Um, you, you, people were defenseless against it. Because, because the state wasn't intervening, apart from in a tiny number of cases. So, you know, this would involve people being beaten to death, uh, shot in front of their family. Often at night, you know, people's houses would be surrounded. They'd be pulled out of their house. They'd be threatened. And sometimes it would say, we're going to come back and kill you next time. Um, these were life-changing moments, whether someone was killed or not, for entire populations you know people didn't recover from these moments and often there would be a lot of humiliation involved you know people would be paraded through the streets forced to drink castor oil which kind of upset your stomach in a really violent way um forced to say long live Mussolini so they're kind of horrible public humiliation as well as the violence where's the burning down of houses um, you know, after the March on Rome, there's the massacre of Turin, which I talk about in my book, where they, the squadristi are kind of let off the leash and go around Turin, just rounding people up and shooting them for a couple of days. And it's like a sort of pogrom or something. 
Um, so it's pretty horrible in people's lives. You know, people are forced into hiding. People are forced, don't know whether they, they're going to live or die in the next year. Thousands of people are forced into exile outside of Italy because they're no longer safe. And these are often defenseless old socialists. They're not dangerous people, people who can't defend themselves. I talk about a guy called Modigliani, who was a kind of old socialist, like in his 60s, 70s, being beaten up by hundreds of fascists. You know, it's pretty horrible stuff. And he's forced out of Italy and has to go and live in France. So, yeah, it's it's merciless. It's But it's also targeted. I think that's the thing. It's very carefully calibrated. It's not wild. They don't just kill anybody. They kill and threaten specific people most of the time and that's why it's so effective um as well yeah that's interesting so so they operate like gangsters essentially they're not just like you say they're not just running around like lunatics just randomly threatening political people gangsters, or, i think yeah, politics, yeah it's political violence yeah it's taken to the extremes you know they kill a socialist deputy in bari mm -hmm. uh walking down the street shooting dead and in 24, they famously kill Matteotti, who's kind of the last man standing, the last socialist standing, mm -hmm. not armed, walking down the street, kidnapped and stabbed to death. You know, this, there's no, there's no limit to their, they will, they don't allow any opposition, um, you know, or any free speech after, mm -hmm. after 23, 24. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting you mentioned Mattiotti because I was going to ask about him because he's quite a prominent figure, isn't he? Like you say, he's pretty much the last man standing. So perhaps speaking to him specifically and then answering this broader question, John, what role did violence play specifically in the governance of Italy? So once the fascists are in power, how does this continuum of, of violence move forward at that point? So after 20... After the fascists take power, you don't really need the the squads in the same way. They still exist for quite a long time, but you don't need to have these con constant attacks because you've kind of won by then, right? So it's reined in. It also becomes state violence. That's really important. So the fascist regime, which kind of builds up from 22, there's still traces of democracy, there's still an election 24, but it's not a proper election. It's It's a it's a fake election, basically. They start to merge, fascism starts to merge with the state. The squadristi are brought into the state, into a militia. Even more scary, if you like, because if you, you're now being attacked by someone who's actually part of the state, who is a police officer, is a squadrista, right? Even more terrifying. Who do you go to? You can't even go and say, arrest this person, because that is the person. <laughs> so... Matteotti is one of the last people to remain in opposition. He's a socialist. Most people have either been arrested, have left politics, have gone into exile. He's very brave. Um, he doesn't think, he kind of also a bit naive. Perhaps he thinks he's too popular to be attacked. And in Rome in June 24, we just had a lot of anniversary things about him. It's 100 years ago. He was picked up by some killers, some hitmen, from Mussolini's kind of in, internal gangs who were used as kind of hitmen, squads, um, against individuals. He's picked up. Whether they meant to kill him or not, we don't know for sure, but they do. Um, it's a huge scandal. It's the only moment where Mussolini kind of trembles a bit because there is a kind of revulsion in the country against this, against this killing, but there's no organisation, really. And he survives. In fact, he takes control even more on the back of this. So it's the kind of the last. There, are, there are other political murders in the twenties and thirties, but this is the last really big one. Yeah. Um, there's no need anymore. There are a few, you know, leading figures still killed, um, but you know, this is the. You know, they, they they can you can arrest them now, just put them in jail for twenty years. You don't have yeah. to kill them anymore and just shut them up that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has the full state apparatus at his, his disposal, yeah. so he doesn't have to, like you say, he doesn't have to. You just rely on the squadristi. He can he can use you know the the, the powers of it and and the police, which 
of course, are, are above the law. There's, there's no one, there's no, not much, well, there's not much recourse if, if the police do something to you. I mean, we do, in liberal democracies, there's some some recourse, and it, it might take a lot of time and a lot of money to, to go through that. But if you've got, like you say, a, a, a political, you know, political gangster, so to speak, at the helm, then then you really have you really have no chance at all. And it's interesting you mentioned that there was there being that revulsion in the wake of the the assassination of Mattiotti, because that is something that, that you think, well, is something changing at this point? Is is there some sort of moral outrage at, at what's happening? Is is that just one too far? But then Mussolini sort of solidifies his, his power after that. So this begs the question at this point, then John, who who is fascism wonderful for? Well, I think, you know, it brings order. Um, so the chaos and the of post-war Italy ends. You have a very strong state. Um, there are no more strikes. They're banned. Uh, there's no more opposition. There are more socialists. There are more communists. So for a lot of people, that's great. You know, the many people in the middle classes who are terrified, I mean, you know, understandably, uh, I wrote a piece years ago about shopkeepers um, and the, what socialists were saying about shopkeepers. Socialists were saying, we're going to expropriate all your shops. You know, they were terrified and they maybe they had a right to be. So lots of middle class groups, the bis industrialists are obviously overjoyed because they they don't need to worry about trade unions anymore. Um, and the many elites and also many people, obviously the people who join the fascists become the new elite. And they become very powerful. I mean, the local local power bases, they're called RAS. The local fascist leaders become the the key figures in each city. Mussolini is quite careful to make to move people around, make sure nobody comes too powerful because he any potential rival, he you know, he moves them around, moves them to the colonies and so on. So for lots of groups, it's um it's 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 a good thing they like it and and also abroad you know Mussolini is very popular Churchill was a huge fan of Mussolini for a long time until the unfortunate events of 1940 um right up to there you know you can find lots of quotes um of democrats in other countries who are very enamored of Mussolini so you know it works for quite a lot of people um even he never really penetrates the industrial working class, I don't think, anything beyond a sort of passive acceptance. Um, many people accept it, but don't like it. Um, but, you know, it's, in, it's an extre extremely well-constructed, totalitarian, repressive state with lots of secret police and spies, which, you know, by the 30s is a well-oiled machine that the opposition is nothing it doesn't exist i mean it's mm. handfuls of people which is you know pretty incredible kind of thing to construct in a decade yeah yeah absolutely so and i know i'm, I'm going to be careful how i ask this question because i know people get really annoyed when you try to conflate mussolini and hitler and, and, I, and I get that but in terms of influence mussolini does have a big influence on hitler doesn't he so what what sort of influence does Mussolini have on Hitler, and what does what does Hitler derive from what he sees in fascist Italy? Yeah, it's something that annoys me about the way n Nazism is talked about, as if it sort of comes from nowhere. I mean, it, Mussolini, you don't have Hitler without Mussolini. You don't have Nazism without fascism. Uh, you, you don't have lots of things without fascism. I mean, it's the first fascist movement, the first fascist regime invents the word. Hitler copies loads of aspects from the slogans and the uniforms and the stormtroopers. I mean, it's different. There are differences, obviously. Um, most notably, you know, the role of anti-Semitism, and we could talk about that, which is much more predominant in Nazism than it is in, in fascism. But all kinds of aspects, even the strategy, you know, the Beer Hall Putsch is a kind of copy of the March on Rome. You know, I mean, it fails, but it's very much a very, very similar kind of, you know, it's it, it draws a lot of his inspiration from from what they've seen, not and seen as a as a as a, as a regime as well. Um, and that 
and it's not just there it's also franco and portuguese fascism and all other fascisms uh, even steve you know i know it's not going to trite comparisons there is a debate to be had even someone like steve bannon you know is a self-professed admirer of mussolini and as a scholar of mussolini and you know i mean he <laughs> that's an interesting question to get into maybe um maybe not this time who knows so i think it's that there's a lot of connection between the two movements and 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 it's often underestimated there's often mussolini's kind of seen as a as a kind of light fascism or sort of you know it's sort of fascism for nice people yeah or something like that and, and all the violence that i've spoken about is kind of written out yeah. or seen as less you know if you if your comparison is auschwitz right everything's going to be less sure yeah and that, that kind of lets mussolini off the hook a lot of the time yeah. and it, i think it's a silly it's not a good way to see things you know um it's if you use that then your your comparison is not going to work yeah yeah and it's the, also comparing backwards which is another yeah good way of doing it. It, yeah it's it's almost like a form of what aboutism if you like yeah. it's it's like saying well well what about this horrendous thing over here which is one of the most heinous things that's happened in the history of the 20th century um, so yeah, I, I agree. I, I, don't, I don't think it's particularly useful. But what what is clear from what you're saying is that Mussolini creates a playbook for fascism, and that and and, and you can use that how, however you want. So Hitler, for example, you know, it, it seems in Mussolini's fascist Italy, if you behave yourself, if you behave yourself, quote unquote, then you'll be okay. Whereas yeah. with Hitler, he's he's much more pernicious. And much more proactive in in his evil and his persecution of others because he's identified certain groups where he's saying I'm proactively going to persecute you, kill you, get rid of you, whatever. Whereas Mussolini didn't do that, and I think that the anti-Semitism grew, it, it increased in Italy in the wake of Hitler's involvement with Mussolini. Is that correct? Did did, did Hitler influence Mussolini on that side of things? Just before we get onto that, I think where you need to see exterminatory Italian fascism is in the colonies. Mm. So in Italy, they didn't need to do it. I mean, they kind of won. And it's often said Muslims didn't kill anybody. Well, that's rubbish. But, you know, he, he didn't need to because they built this extraordinary police state. Right. I mean, there was no opposition left. It's, it's, it's just no need. Why bother? Right. They did still kill people. But, you know. But in the colonies, you get forms of genocide in Libya, in Ethiopia, um, which have been well documented. You get poison gas being dropped, you know, a series of war crimes and genocide, um, which is where, if you like, if you're going to make that, that comparison with Hitler, you might make it there more than back in Italy. And in terms of anti-Semitism, there's a massive long debate, historical debate. There are obviously anti-Semites anti in Italian fascism. They're also Italian Jews in Italian fascism. It doesn't become a policy really until 1938. And that is, to some extent, uh, part of the alliance with Hitler. It also has it internal roots. Um, and it's also, as some historians have shown, some of the stuff Mussolini does is also copied by Hitler in terms of the so this, it's not only a one-way thing. And in 38, the um, Italian regime passes anti-Semitic laws. Italian Jews are with about 55,000, so it's a pretty tiny population. doesn't mean make it better, but the numbers are smaller, are marginalised, um, discriminated against. Kids are kicked out of schools, for example. Uh, university lecturers are sacked and so on. It paves the way for... 10,000 Italian Jews under Nazi occupation to be sent to, mainly to Auschwitz. So it isn't exterminatory in itself, but it paves the way for that to happen to, you know, quite a high percentage of a, yeah. of a small population. So there's a long debate about that. And it's another dark period in another dark message mm. uh, in a dark moment in Italian history, for sure, um, yeah. which is still being talked about. Yeah, absolutely. And when you mentioned about how Churchill was quite favourable to to Mussolini prior to Italy's involvement in in World War Two, 
th th there is something in terms of the the English being against fascist Italy, at least on the football pitch. So tell us about that that football match that that you that you write about in the book. The Battle of Highbury. Yeah. Yeah, 30, oh, let me get this right, 34, I'm pretty sure it is. I'm, I've read my own work for a bit. Um, so, you know, there's the World Cup, but England don't take part because we're the best, so we don't need to take part. <laughs> uh yeah, that's that's the that's the um narrative anyway italy winning it right fascist fascist italy really understood sport so fascist italy is not just violence right it is violence is very important but it's not just violence it's also culture it's also mass culture it understands sport really well uh and football in particular but not just football and it it sees sport as a way of creating consensus it puts a lot of money into it builds hundreds of stadiums you go to italy Many of the stadiums that you'll go to are still those built by in the 30s. Wins the World Cup in 34, but England say, oh, well, we're still the world champions because we didn't bother to take part. So they play this game in, in uh, Arsenal's ground, Highbury, and it turns into this kind of extremely violent football game called the Battle of Highbury, where England go 3 nil up. Um, somebody, is, I think, has their leg broken. And the Italians come back to 3-2 with a great player called Miazza, who an incredible footballer um and so they managed to present a defeat as a victory um which is not quite what happened with the euros game last night but um they did they present the um this this defeat as this heroic heroic defeat where they've been badly treated and it's it's called the battle of highbury and the and the players are presented as heroes when they come back and uh, it's a very interesting kind of propaganda moment uh, and seen very differently in England and in Italy, because the the memoirs of the Italian English players who take place, so well, the Italians were animals and they were really mm. violent. They kicked us, tried to kick us off the park, and you know, there's that. There's two very different narratives. Yeah, of, yeah, of game. yeah. Maybe maybe a bit of fake news going on there in in sport. Oh, I think perhaps. on both sides. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the Italian foot radio. It was all on radio, right? It wasn't on. It wasn't on. No one saw the film of this. Or if mm. they did it, they didn't understand it. The the commentator was famously biased, uh, right. and he presented it to the Italian public. I mean, they didn't have any alternative, and mm. they didn't have social media to give them different views on that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no there's no Twitter or X as it's right. now called. Um, Just one radio station. That's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So so that makes it and that and that. And when you think about it like that, and you, you just try and put yourself in that situation, I I can remember when we only had four channels on on terrestrial tv but if, if you sort of rewind to that and you think about how you know what life is like minus a smartphone minus the internet and you realize how narrow these channels of information are and that if if someone controls that or the state controls that you you really don't know what's going on you really don't know anything other than than what you've been told so it does sound like and especially in that context as well john it does sound like you were saying that that Mussolini and the fascists really do have things locked down here. There's no opposition, so there doesn't really need to be a great deal of extermination internally. So where does it all go wrong for them? It sounds like it, it's it, power is theirs to lose. Where does it all go wrong? They they sort of it it goes wrong partly through the alliance. Well, largely through this alliance with Hitler, which Mussolini. I mean, that's obviously an historical mistake looking in hindsight. And the idea that on the coattails of Hitler's sort of expansionist global dominance project, they can, Italian fascism can, you know, take control of some more land, can take more, can have a bigger kind of empire. So it's a kind of opportunist idea, which is looking back, a clearly a, um, a disastrous tactical, historical, military, and also an, a kind of, you, you feel that Mussolini starts to begin, believe some of his own propaganda about, you know, 10 million bayonets and a militarised society. And maybe this is a bit softer than, than they realise. So in 1940, um, they go into the war just at the moment that France is about to fall, really. Extremely opportunistic kind of 
And this goes quite well for a little bit, but the war quickly becomes very unpopular. And at the moment of going to the war, yeah, there are signs of some dissatisfaction with Mussolini, but, you know, the regime was pretty solid. And I, I mean, I've said, I've written in the book that, in my opinion, if they hadn't gone in like Franco in Spain, that Mussolini would have gone on until he died, you know, of old age. Or whatever. I mean, the regime was, there was no, no sign of it, even wobbling um, a tiny bit, really. But the war changes everything because it goes wrong. Uh, there's not much enthusiasm for it. Um, the attack on Greece, for example, so Mussolini thinks he can conquer Greece, which is a kind of long held Italian imperial idea and it goes yeah. badly wrong they lose he, he had a thing for Corfu didn't he yeah they, they they take some of the islands but I mean they keep doing that anyway but this is a much bigger project right and it they can't do it the army's not ready so you, you kind of start to realise that some of the propaganda is just propaganda and some of the marching around of the people is perhaps you know they were doing that because they had to but not because they really believed in some sort of fascist state. So you start to think, well, the actual real fascists, the fervent ones, are pretty small. There's a lot of passive acceptance, either because people had to or because that was easier. And that's very much exposed by the war. And when Italy start getting bombed, invaded, you know, <laughs> it's going badly wrong quite quickly, right? And in 1943, the king who hasn't done anything in 20 years, apart from march around becoming emperor of other countries, pulls the plug on Mussolini. And uh, that's the end, more or less the end of fascism, although it kind of bits of it struggle on until 1945. So it all falls apart with the war. And it's, it is revealing, I think, of the perhaps soft, soft underbelly of all those huge demos and speeches um you know uh maybe you know Mussolini he he should have been more cynical at that point um than he really was he thought more people would follow him than would so he started to believe his own hype then didn't he because you mentioned about there being this soft underbelly but there was an awful lot of pomp around fascism and the parades and Mussolini you often see him in pictures with this, you know, sort of power pose where he's projecting this image of power and strength. And I know people have talked about the power pose. If you want to feel more confident, you know, do this power pose for 15 seconds or whatever in, in the, the bathroom and and then go out and give your speech or whatever. And, and Mussolini was doing this all the time, wasn't he? But, but he was posing like this in front of the camera. So he's, he's projecting this image of real strength but he's also wearing all this regalia and the military uniforms and everything else. So a real image of power, which seems to belie the truth that underneath of, underneath that image, there's not actually a great deal of substance there. So, so talk through John, what, what does this, what does this actually look like then? So the fascists lose power. The King says, right, enough's enough. You're off Mussolini. What happens to Mussolini? at that point what what what's his next move because this is a guy who has been so used to being in absolute control he's had that taken away from him from somebody who he thought was pretty much a benign player in this who, who had no teeth whatsoever so so what does Mussolini do next what's his next move after losing power like that you get this extraordinary period in 19, July 1943 Mussolini is arrested on the orders of the king so they left this king in place and they don't they don't really take him seriously but it's quite a weird thing to do is to leave someone with these powers in place and they never thought they'd be used against there's also an internal revolt which is also important a lot of Mussolini's closest allies turn against him so he's lost kind of the inner sanctum if you like he gets arrested he gets taken to this uh, sort of hotel prison way up in the mountains in central Italy, the Nazis then think he might be useful to them. So they spring him from there, take him back to Germany, then bring him back. And he's put in charge of a kind of puppet government called the Republic, Republic, Italian Social Republic. It's a republic now, they're not like the king anymore. Um, but it's people to be, to insult it, call it 
the Republic of Salo, which is a small town. It was based up on the lakes in northern Italy. And it doesn't. It has a certain amount of power, particularly in terms of the violence it can use locally. But it's basically a puppet government. I mean, the Nazis are at this point in charge of of Italy. Have occupied that most of Italy. So you get this incredible moment of kind of a number of wars going on at the same time. You've got the Allies coming up, fighting the, the Nazis and the Italians. You've got the Italians fighting amongst themselves in the Civil War because you've got the birth of the resistance to fascism and you've still got Mussolini's faithful fascists fighting each other. That's going on as well at the same time as, as a kind of military battle between the Nazis and the Allies. So, it's, you know... Italy has kind of lost control of itself at that point. Mussolini is a very much weakened figure with very few powers who's kind of sees the end coming. I mean, he's not, by that point, he doesn't have many illusions. Um, he can see that the end, and he's trying to work out what the hell am I going to do now as, as, as the Allies move up closer and closer to him. You know, where's he going to go? Um, this man who's so instantly recognisable because you said everybody knew his photo, everybody had seen his film. This is the most recognisable person in Italy by miles. So it's not as if he can hide. <laughs> and he is a very recognisable physical figure as well, you know. So what's he going to do? It's, an, it's a very dramatic moment. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. He is, he's got very distinct features and so he has plastered them everywhere. So it's not like he can... He can hide and get away, but he doesn't get away, does he? He gets caught. So, tell us about how how it all comes, how it does come to an end for Mussolini. So, I mean, he he tries various strategies, and I was just reading an, another book about his last days. But he ends up, and it's it's a very ignominious end to someone who had been idolised as a kind of god, you know. And he dressed up as a German sh soldier, hiding in the back of a van trying to get out of Italy on a convoy and they're going up towards Switzerland. The plan is to get to Switzerland and then see if they can make it from there. Um, you know, make it across the border and somehow go into exile. That's the plan. It's not much of a plan, but that is the plan. And they get stopped by partisans, communist partisans. Someone recognises Mussolini. He's with his mistress, Claretta Patacci, and a, a number of leading fascists are in the van as well. Um, Mussolini and, and Patacci are taken, are held for a night in a villa in the hills and then executed next day on the orders of the resistance leadership. So he's given the death sentence, but he's shot on the side of a road. All the other leading fascist court are shot on by the lake in a place called Dongo. The bodies are then taken to Milan. And this is the moment of revolution because people have r risen up against fascism in Milan. There's been insurrection, the end of fascism, the return of democracy, and the, as Mussolini's body is there lying on the ground. I mean, there's a, you can watch film of it. It's an incredible thing to see. It's like the most symbolic and famous moment of the Second World War in many ways, the end of the Second World War. One of the most symbolic, like the, with the taking of Berlin, it's it's up there and Stalingrad. You know, this is, this is a moment that made people's careers in terms of journalists as well. And he's, because... People get trampling on him. There's a lot of people there. They, they tie him up by his feet in the square in, in Milan. And people, you know, it's, there's, I, I, I really got into analysing this. And there's a lot on this in the book. It's a kind of overturning. Like it's, his last, it's his last meeting, but he's dead. And people are still looking at him. They're still obsessed with him, but he's no, he's no longer in charge. You know, there's a lot of symbolic stuff going on here. Um, and then there's the after story, which is also more, even more crazy. His body's hidden, uh, stolen, all kinds of things happen. And you can, you can now go and visit it um, if you want to. I've been yeah, for professional capacity. It's a fascinating thing to do in a place called Bradapio, where it's surrounded by fascists. And you go into this very weird family vault, um, which has become a kind of gathering place for fascists um, in the last... He was finally buried there in 58, so he's been there for 60 or so years. It's become a gathering place, very controversial place um, in Italy. 
Yeah, yeah, that it is fascinating. What what strikes me about it is, like you say, I think ignominious is the word because it's such a stark contrast to him being in all of his pomp and his regalia and doing the public speeches, making all the expressions, bellowing to to the crowds to be hung upside down. Was it on a lamppost by a petrol a station? Or... Yeah. yeah, a petrol station, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of them. I mean, they hang them all up on quite yeah. a lot of amazing photos of that as well. Yeah, and someone as well who prided himself on his his sexual escapades and and exploits being hung next to his his well his primary extramarital lover Claretta Patacci so it's it's fascinating really how there is this ignominious display it's not like he falls apart in private or he does get away to Switzerland and he just kind of rots away in in private or in in a discreet manner this is so public and it's so stark that nobody can mistake this. Everybody knows this guy is done in, in every respect, you know, not just politically, not just in relation to power, but this is his physical corpse been hung upside down at a petrol station with, with his lover. So it, it really, really strikes me. It's, it's almost like a, it's almost like a fable. It's almost like a, a fairy tale with a moral to the story. So if you were going to put it, like that john what can we learn from mussolini's ascent and ignominious descent collectively and perhaps even individually as well well i think one thing there's a number of things i mean there's so many i often see parallels without using the word fascist in a in a trite way which i think a lot of people do i see a lot of parallels with lots of things going on in today's world and i think one of the things is to take small movements seriously you know and not see them as a joke or as something that can be controlled it didn't take long for this tiny number of people to take power and and they weren't taken seriously enough and the state wasn't able to contrast them and i think you can see examples you know when i saw the capital riots without drawing, again, trite parallels. I mean, I couldn't help think of March on Rome. And it didn't happen in the same way. But there's an attempt to violently over overturn democratic structures. And I think we can you can see that. So one of the things is to take movements like this seriously, to take violence seriously, to understand that this always begins in a small way. Um, and also, you know, to notice how quickly the rule of law can be undermined, how quickly, like what a battery that we get today um, is is a very dangerous thing, I think. Um, and things slip quite quickly. I mean, you know, in the UK, we've had two MPs murdered. Um, it doesn't feel like that is particularly important or has enough of an impact on on our sort of public memory it's almost like it didn't happen um mm. so and then i think those are it's interesting times in terms of these pa historical parallels obviously you're not going to get black shirted it's not the same it's never history never returns in the same way but i think some of the features democracy is a fragile thing and i think um you know, it depends on every, on consensus and consent. And in some big countries in the world, like America, you can see signs of, you know, that consent crumbling a little bit. And it's quite interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you think about what happened recently with um, the attempted assassination of Donald Trump as well. Mm -hmm. So it can happen, like you say, it doesn't have to be a like for like in terms of the political spectrum. It can happen from from anywhere. You know, the, the enemies of of democracy are, are many and quite disparate. So I, th I think it's a great point you make there about taking small movements seriously, because goodness knows there was no social media that I mean, if Mussolini was on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or whatever, and he was getting support that way, 
then he could have maybe even grown grown even faster. Now you've got all sorts of folks on these digital platforms selling ideas, selling philosophies, other approaches, and appealing on a very emotional level, on a very demagogic level, whether they're doing that at large or whether they're doing that on a smaller scale. So I think vigilance is the key. I think that's fair to say, isn't it, John? It, you know, vigilance is the key to take these things seriously, to not blow them off. And I do agree. I think with the the murders of the MPs that we had in the UK, we, we didn't really keep them in in memory so well. We we kind of they were seen as tragedies, of course, but they were moved on from very quickly. And I think we should be careful to to take care of our own backyard. And I think the playbook, there is a playbook. Uh, Ruth Ben Gia, to a historian, written a very interesting book called Strong Men. And, you know, whether things are different, things are always different in history, but there's a kind of playbook that does repeat. And, you know, fascinating for me, again, to see the, the Trump assassination thing and, and think back to Mussolini in 1926, three assassination attempts on Mussolini. He escaped all of them, one of them by just moving his head. <laughs> I mean, it, the parallels are crazy. Um, and they were very much helpful to him, although he wouldn't have wished them upon himself. Um, politically, they he was very astute in, and I, you know, this could well happen again, but it's just extraordinary the, the parallels that I can see there, um, 26 and and now. I mean, there's, there's lots of differences, but, yeah. um, you know, these things can change history one way or the other, one yeah. inch either way. This um, Irish woman tried to kill Mussolini in Rome called Violet Gibson and she got very close to him, shot him and just he just moved his head and he just got the edge of his nose but you know, mm. how close is that? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's very close, right? Um, yeah, exactly, yeah and, and how does... Ama amazing, so there's a playbook um, and it, it repeats um, with different actors and different histories but yeah as playbooks to how democracies live and die, I think that we can, we have to be very aware of. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good place to leave it then, John. Thank you so much for your time on the Real Clear Values podcast. You're welcome. It's good to talk to you.